But again, nothing effective was done. From the official start date, August 15, 1985, until the day before the launch of the 25th flight, we had not made one meaningful test on the joint that we needed. The problem had still not been solved when Krista McAuliffe and Barbara Morgan joined the six other crew members in Houston to prepare for a January launch. We went through um, what they called payload specialist training. We were, we were being trained as spaceflight observers. And basically that training at that time was a familiarization with the shuttle, um, more, most importantly of all, learning how to be a crew member and blending in with the crew and being safe and uh, practicing the things that Krista was gonna be doing on the flight and then basic habitability and safety kinds of training. By the time the Challenger crew arrived in Florida, they were already behind schedule. The previous shuttle had been delayed a record six times, and with 12 launches planned for the coming year, NASA was keen to see Challenger go. On the eve of the launch, Krista's parents, Grace and Ed Corrigan, were invited to join the seven astronauts and their families for the traditional farewell party. In order to go to the beach house, you had to make sure that, uh, the doctors had to make sure that you didn't have a cold or were coming down with something, and so we had to have a doctor's examination. And uh, the next morning, a car came and picked us up and took us down to the beach house, and then uh, a van came in with all the crew, the 51-hour crew. And so we had a couple of hours together, had lunch there. Krista had said to us, she was looking forward to it very much. She wasn't apprehensive at all about liftoff, but uh, I think it was just maybe a little more sobering and nearer it became to the time of going. When we were leaving, we were walking down the steps to get into the car and kissed Chris goodbye, and I said, oh, have a wonderful trip and all that, you know, and uh, Ed kissed her goodbye, and then she kind of pulled him back, and she kissed him again, and when he came down, he was kind of thoughtful, and he said, it's almost as if she didn't want me to go, <laughs> and that was the last time we saw her. With less than 24 hours to go before liftoff, the launch control team began to work through the four thick volumes of procedures to activate Challenger's flight systems. I'm always nervous. Uh, the last nine minutes of a countdown, I'm always nervous. My hands are shaking, my heart's beating real fast. Um, not that I expect anything to go wrong, but just because there's so many things that could go wrong. At the same time, the mission management team was getting the latest weather forecast from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The weather situation was undergoing a lot of change. We expected a uh, cold front to actually sweep through the uh, Cape area on, um, which would have been then Sunday morning, and we expected it to bring in cloudiness, uh, showers, and possibly even thunderstorms. Within the hour, they needed to decide whether to start tanking the vehicle with half a million gallons of unstable fuel or to delay the launch. As they debated the options, Grace Corrigan enjoyed a privileged night viewing. It was very beautiful. You pulled up and you were able to get out of the van and the shuttle was all in lights and it was it was really quite beautiful it was very cold very cold but uh, it was a lovely sight it was kind of unreal it was you know the feeling you looked up there and it was a, almost like a, a fairyland you know to see all these twinkling lights and that and then to think that this object was going to be up in orbit you know it was it was a little unreal but while Grace was at the launch pad, 
the mission management team had decided to delay takeoff until Monday morning because of the forecast bad weather. As the sun rose on a beautiful Sunday morning, it was clear that the weather station had got it badly wrong. We had been told on Saturday evening by the weather folks uh, that we'd have a, a lot of wind and some rain, a front moving through, and uh, we met and we decided that we would not launch on Sunday, that we would wait, and Sunday was a beautiful day. <laughs> we missed an opportunity to launch. With 24 hours to lift off, the astronauts had time to kill, in quarantine. But it didn't stop Krista and Greg Jarvis from taking a bike ride. Make sure you stay six feet away from me, you quarantine. <laughs> Barbara Morgan, who would be providing ground support for Krista during the mission, was staying next door to the Corrigans. They were having a Super Bowl party. It was phenomenal. They were so sweet to let me come in and, and come say hi and meet the, meet the rest of the family. The Corrigan's home team, the New England Patriots, were playing the Chicago Bears. We were drinking beer for the Patriots, and we had our champagne cooling for Christy, you know, when she went up. So it was a big party. It was a lot of fun. The Patriots, however, were soundly beaten, 46-10. It was not a good omen. By early evening, the launch control team assembled once again, this time hoping for a clear run. At 1.30 a.m., the firing room gave the go-ahead to begin tanking, an expensive process and therefore a serious commitment. Uh, we make a decision to tank that big tank and to fill it with oxygen and hydrant, mostly based on the weather. If we feel like we've got a good chance to launch the next day, uh, and tanking starts about nine hours before launch, we go ahead. By early morning, everything was ready for the final countdown. The crew were told to prepare for departure while close tabs were kept on the changing weather. Of course, I went home uh, after the regular duty day on Sunday and came back for the launch attempt on Monday. Again, I was monitoring the uh, radar. But the day started out relatively good. If I recall, we had scattered or broken clouds, but the clouds did get thicker. With strong crosswinds predicted for early afternoon, there was growing pressure to launch. At 7 a.m., the crew were ready for the ritual walkout. Uh, the crew walkout is, is something that's uh, kind of tradition. This, this is the last opportunity for the world, for the news media, for the friends, families to, to see them and, and say hi. Now, you can't touch them or shake hands or anything because they're in quarantine, but you can uh, actually get probably as close as I am to you as they walk by for, for a fleeting couple of seconds, and then they go into the vehicle and off to the pad. At pad 39B, the crew took the elevator to level 195. 